Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. All right. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor of almost 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. And this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. So I'm a strength coach. I compete in, well, whatever comes around. But most recently, powerlifting again. So just had a meet last weekend. But feeling good. Excellent. Yeah, we're going to get to that as um, part of our topic today. Everyone, this is a crazy couple of weeks. We're actually doing these time warp recordings. So if you hear anything inconsistently week to week from the temporal side, it's because we're not – what you're hearing on a Saturday or a Sunday was probably recorded the week before. And it will straighten up once we get through the next week or two. But anyway, any kind of inconsistencies, that's why we're recording a few things out of sequence here. But – we do have some um, mail. We have some news. Yeah, then we're going to talk about Phil's meat, and then hopefully we're going to check in with Dr. Nelson. Uh, he's giving a, another presentation. In fact, he's out by you somewhere, Phil. Uh, Kansas okay. City, maybe? Oh, yeah, he's in Kansas City. It's the fit, big fitness summit this weekend. Okay. The KC Fitness Summit. That's where he is. Yep. So I asked him to maybe do a little travel log. We'll see if we can get some audio from him. Uh, all right. Let's start with a question for you, Phil. Uh, everyone, we were just discussing this before we hit the record button, but this is from Grant, who's a med student. He says, I was curious about Phil's hip replacement. Uh, in his implant design, to have that heavy of a squat load put on it just seems you know, unusual. Every time I hear him talk about it, I'm amazed and a little scared that it can withstand those forces. And I was curious if it was designed to be able to do that or if he's just extra careful and has surrounding structures trained to be strong enough to take up some of the pressure. Uh, if he does not want that information given out, I do understand. <laughs> Gotta love <laughs> Gotta love HIPAA. Aha. <laughs> so anyway, I guess he's just concerned about that you're asking your hip. First of all, is it special? And if it's not, how do you get away with what you're doing? Oh, I wish it was special. I, yeah, that'd be awesome if I could say the yeah, they specially designed one for me of NASA. Right. No. Uh, right. <laughs> no, it's not special. Um, as far as I know, I mean, it's the latest technology as far as I know, which who knows now, two, three years later, there's probably something new. But uh, my understanding uh, from speaking with my orthopedic surgeon is that the the, the hip itself will handle as much load as I want it to. It's okay. the pounding and things like that, that uh, like dynamic moves and pounding, running is the things he never wanted me to do. Now, that said, when he told me he, I can load it however much I want, did he mean 700 pounds? Probably not. <laughs> right. And that's just me being honest. Right, yeah. You no, know, he's probably not thinking that. He's probably, oh, this guy's going to go in and squat 315 for some reps or something. So... No, I mean, and that's like I was telling you before we came on, I'm kind of an N of one, and I'm, at this point now, after squatting 700 this weekend, uh, I don't know someone else who has uh, on a hip, so maybe I am, like, the only person, I don't know, there's probably some freak out there that's done it, too, but uh, not many of us, so I'm kind of in uncharted waters, but uh, I don't know, I mean, I've always been one of those people that... When I was seven and got ran over, they told me I'd never walk again and things like that. And I was like, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it feels good. I have no pain. It, it, it was, I was very nervous with it at the very beginning. Um, there was some, well, I mean, the biggest hurdle I had to come back from, from was mental. And because it, I did, it did scare me. Like, is this thing going to hold up? And yeah. yeah. Now I don't even think about it. I mean, I have no pain. I have no uh, no weird feelings in it. At, at the very beginning, there was some clunking and things like that that would go on from time to time. 
but from what I've heard talking to others, that was normal. That was, uh, you just got to give time for the connective tissue to tighten back up. You know, they, it's, it's a very invasive procedure when they go in and replace a hip. Right. So they're hacking, they're hacking through and a lot of things. So I had to give time for those muscles to pull back in. And, uh, it's the muscles that kind of keep the, uh, that hip in its joint. So, Mm -hmm. um, and that's also why I was told not to do things like, okay, don't go snow skiing. Don't go, you know, right. It's, it's big jolts and, and jams like that. They can potentially pop it out. But as far as just static loading, uh, it's potentially should be fine. So, okay. Yeah. I would think the metal alloys themselves are strong as hell. You know, mm-hmm. it's more, what would worry me would be, like you said, that procedure, and again, I am not an orthopod, but mm-hmm. they, it, if I remember right, they just hammer a, sort of like this metal spike right down into your femur, yes. you know, yeah. and I mean, the interface with the bone, which is, yeah. would be what I would be concerned about, but you would think there are many inches probably uh, of surface area between the metal and all that bone and yeah and how much it in, sort of it embraces it you know and connects with it and that mm-hmm. and like you said all the surrounding structures grant i think that's my opinion not being a, a medical doctor is that's how phil gets away with a lot of that right there's so yeah. much meat and a lot of that yeah, musculature that's, that's like right? there's a lot of it and i mean that's that's also the reason like my my hip replacement procedure took much longer than he expected He's like, you had a lot more stuff to go through than I've ever gone through. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. So, um, so my scar ended up being much bigger and things like that. But from what I've talked to, to surgeons about, it was like the the implant itself. He's like, no, that thing's bonded in there. It's not going anywhere. Like you're not going to get that out. It's the it's the uh, it's the juncture of the ball and the socket. Yes, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, of the implant itself, not not where it bonds with the bone. He's like, after after six months a year, it's fine. And you have to remember, I took several years after, and I didn't move relative to me heavyweight. So, and it wasn't until just recently, after a couple of years, that it was like, okay, let's see if I can step on the platform again. Uh, so there was a good amount of time in there that I I just worked on on stuff. So yeah, I'm with Grant aggressively. Uh, you aggressively have gone after performance regardless of, of sur- like you bank on your surgeries. <laughs> like oh, yeah. when you, when I you mean, did your biceps repair, I was like, yeah. I was cringing because when I had my triceps repair, I wasn't a wuss. I mean, I did what they said in physical therapy, but yeah. it felt to me like you're like, okay, PT for like two weeks and I'm going to start actually starting <laughs> to lift some things in the gym. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, uh, you're just, you expect them to p- perform. I guess, yeah. you know, the well, repairs. And I'm aggressive with it, but like I, I'm aggressive, but not stupid is what I try to do. If I feel anything that feels odd, I just back off. Like this weekend on my third squat, uh, I went down and there was some pain. So I just sat there and told them to take it, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to push against this. If there yep. was pain in there. It's, it's not worth it. So, right. I mean, at this point, I got nothing left to prove on the platform. The only thing I'm doing is proving things to myself. I want to get there out there and have fun. It's fun for me. To just still do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and you're breaking new ground, too. Like I said, yeah. I think we should do a case study on you or something, right? Just yeah. to kind of document what's what's possible. Because you're right. I'm sure when they say this will take whatever you can throw at it, they're not thinking about performing power lifters, you know, when yes. they say that. They're thinking – like I remember my sister, who's an orthopedic surgeon – she was talking about knee replacements and stuff and how they just sort of try to get the hamstrings to kind of scar down into place. And I'm like, you don't like go in there and heavily suture all, all every end of that in every way. And it, it just sounded very wimpy to me, you know, and then you hear stuff like uh, when they did my elbow repair, they said something about, oh, you, you know, you, you could have just let this go. You would have had a nice, decent 70 percent function as yeah, if that was OK, you know, yeah. and I'm like, wow, no, not OK, you know, yeah. Um Another thing, uh, this is just experiential, but I used to read articles every once in a while in muscle magazines about a bodybuilder who was in a car wreck and got thrown through the window, you know, half toward the steering wheel off the car and ended up 20 feet away. And they would say your muscle mass probably saved you. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of what's going on here. The, The amount of soft tissue around some of these articulations, like you said, right where the mm-hmm. the ball and the socket connect, 
that's not something you're going to see studies on, right? There's, no. I've always no. wanted to document strength athletes in the literature. I think that would be a simple, just stick them in an MRI unit. I don't yeah. know. Just sort of take a look at what Fortress used to say. You can learn a lot, and I think he got this from Tom Platts. You can learn a lot about the average vehicle by studying a dragster. Yeah. You know, like, like what is the upper end um, anyway? So and yeah, I mean it's it's just tough for me. I mean, I like I said, I tried to sit out for a few years and I tried to mentally be like, okay, I'm done, and I'm just gonna train. And I'm not. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, I just I lost something. I wasn't having fun. And it's when it comes down to it, when before my hip replacement, I was taking a risk going out there picking up 800 pounds, and I'm still going out there. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a risk, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. For the level of enjoyment I get out of it. You know? Right, yeah. So. Okay. Okay, well, Grant, don't worry about him. It's it's Big Phil. He's <laughs> he's the scar tissue giant oak tree we talk about in the intro, so. I mean, if it goes, it goes, and it probably will be bad. N yeah, but, I mean, we I know that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> we, agree, well, we agree on that. If, if something lets go. But, again, you know, you've got sort of, and I think all strength athletes have a little bit more of this. I don't know, internal proprioception thing, like mind in the muscle thing going on. Like you said, if you sit down in the hole, if something says stop, you know, yeah. that's not the same thing as a wimpy quit. It's yeah. no, I cross some line, something yes. bad yeah. is going to happen. And you can yeah. just kind of tell, I, at yeah. least not always, but yep. often. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, our next question here. Uh, this is anonymous, but uh, this is a couple. They're actually preparing to go on a big hiking trip. Uh, they leave next week. They were debating casein protein to drink the night before because of its slow release and uh, recovery aspects while they sleep. Uh, they tried to do some research. Um, let's see. It's actually hard to find information because everyone's trying to sell you something. Uh, do you have brand recommendations, or can you tell me what we should be looking for in the ingredients list? Um, a complicating factor is that we'd like to find the casein from grass-fed, hormone-free cows. Oh, that now that's some monkey wrench in this. Yeah. Um, I found some European brands that offer this, but I don't know if their formulas are legit. Uh, any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Um, first off, I, I actually remember in 2012, I... I wrote a summary paper for one of the NSCA journals, and I had actually speculated at the time that something like meat or casein that are slower acting proteins, meaning the amino acids rise slowly in your blood, that those might be good to consume before you go to bed, you know, because that's that seven or eight hour stretch where essentially you're fasted and more catabolic and that sort of thing. And we had um, Jorn Tromelin on the show. Uh, oh gosh, months ago, and he was talking about some of that too. Uh, I still remember one of the reviewers saying, well, you don't know that that's going to have any benefit. And I said, no, that's why I pointed out it was speculation. But then interestingly, and I think maybe vindicating me, not long after a paper came out specifically about some of the benefits of casein you know, during the night, because casein clots in your stomach, right? And a, a lot of our listeners know 80% of milk is casein, 20% is um, way, um, but uh, if they're really concerned about specific brands, I'm not sure about the grass-fed, hormone-free uh, sources of this. I don't worry about uh, the hormone-free side of things at all, uh, personally. Um, the grass-fed might have some advantages, I would think, mostly in the lipid profile of the beef that comes from those animals, as opposed to yeah. You know, a huge difference is, I mean, I'm not saying it might not change the lipid profile of the milk, but the casein itself, casein is is what it is. It's casein. It's yeah. a, It'll clot in your stomach. It's slow rise in amino acids in your blood. Um, I suppose you could just go eat cottage cheese, right? The curds are casein. Uh, maybe you could find that from grass-fed cows more easily. I think because they want to go hiking, they need something dry and not spoiling, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so usually I get, whey or whey casein combo powders, but I try not to over rely on them. I was just telling Kelly this morning, I just tend to feel better when I'm eating 
like physique wise, I I feel like when I'm just eating lots of chicken and vegetables, I, I'm doing my best. You know, I, I'm at my best when I do those things. And if I lean too heavily on the powders, once in fact I even I was leaning so heavily just for convenience on dairy proteins. They're very high quality proteins. But I also donate blood fairly regularly. We have sort of a genetic history in my family of thicker blood and, you know, and that sort of thing. And I was, it, and it does good, right? I, I like the idea of the, just helping the world a little bit as well, especially with the extra red blood cells, you know, get grandma jump out of the bed after she has her surgery. <laughs> but um, I actually ended up low iron, believe it or not. And men usually aren't like that, but it is possible, right? I'm donating blood like every three months, every 56 days or whatever it is. I'm eating no meats at all um, because dairy is not going to be the best source of getting your iron you know, up. Uh, so you have to be careful over leaning on some of this stuff. So um, yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't have any specific brands for grass-fed hormone-free casein, but um, especially for as long as you're going to be hiking something like a long trail, like the Appalachian Trail or whatnot, um, what do you? I, I'm not sure what you're afraid of is going to happen if you have regular casein powder. Yeah. Usually, that stuff yeah. is so ultra filtered these days. I don't, I don't see you, you know, getting any kind of con serious contaminants or anything. Or yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, I I'll wouldn't worry about. It. I mean, as far as I've done some pretty extreme hiking stuff, like we used to do trips up to Canada, where we go for a week and literally you'd have a okay, here's your map, good luck, see you in a week. Um, it was just calories <laughs> more than anything yeah. that we needed. We were putting in 20 miles a day in between a canoe and carrying the canoes over hills. And, and that's, that's what it was. So we had like bags of candy and things like that. And you just constantly kept stuff coming in. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. If your me. guys are on a tough, tough hike, I mean, you're just going to need, and we all lost weight still despite eating just whatever we could. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. I imagine that's doubly so <laughs> what, if it's chilly outside. Yeah. If they do this in the summer, it might be a little different. On, yeah. But, yeah, I got to think that, too. Calories are where you're at, man. Nuts, dried fruits, yeah. yep. stuff that won't spoil, lots of nutrients and calories. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, I have a few, few more little tidbits here, reviews. Uh, I, I'm going to table some of this so we can – we could get to Phil, but um, just quickly, if anybody, if you haven't made an iTunes review, uh, it's really helpful. I mentioned that mid-show, but I know a lot of you guys are longtime listeners, and you probably don't really pay much attention to the mid-show announcements, and I, I'm the same way with other podcasts. But please consider making a comment about Iron Radio. Um, it, like I said, it helps us tremendously on sort of the popularity side of things when it comes to uh, iTunes. I've got some reviews here from recent ones from iTunes and Stitcher, um, and they're pretty fun. So I, I'll probably read those in future weeks. But just maybe a shout out to people who, if you haven't uh, made a review, please consider it. Um, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It just it's helpful to let people know that we're here because we do not market and promote like a lot of podcasts. So, all right. Having said that. We're going to go to break early, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk with Phil about his meat. Hey, listeners. This is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead. All that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit uh, royalty on the book. 
But that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we're back. It's Phil and Lonnie, and we are going to talk about his uh, recent competition. Uh, I was sort of suggesting this morning before we started recording, not everybody competes, right? A lot of our listeners actually do, and we've always been supportive of that, putting your name on the dotted line, so to speak, and make the commitment and that sort of thing, whether it's bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, whatever your fancy. Um, and I should also just quickly make a note. Uh, we're going to try to check in with Dr. Nelson and get a little uh, travel log. He's always traveling, right, and recording. So I I'm hoping, if not this week, hopefully this week, but if not, get a little review of the best things that he's learned this year because he's he puts himself in front of some very impressive people, you know, yes. you know regularly, uh, PhDs and all kinds of people. So anyway, uh, but Phil, so let's talk about your meat. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with the highlights, like what stands out in your mind, because you, you, in my mind, are defined by almost constant competing in your life. Like yeah. It seems like you're always doing this. So if something stands out, it's got to be landmark, I would think. So what stood out? Oh, well, for my, there's a couple things. Um, for my, as far as what stands out that pertains to me, um, in the warm-up room, we're getting ready. And one of my lifters is helping handle me, and I'm squatting 135. He's like, man, you're way high. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Don't worry. <laughs> and I get warming up. We get to about 500, and JP, who's running the meet, everybody knows, uh, I'm sure, on the show, JP Price. So what is he, first guy to walk out and squat 1,000? JP's like, hey, Phil, if you need to change your opener, just tell me. I was like, no, JP, I'm here to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. And because uh, people watch me warm up, and apparently they're they're less confident in me than I am. Okay. And uh, I kind of know how things go, and I know that it's uh, around 600 pounds. Things start coming together, right? But uh, uh, yeah, I warm up, and as usual, I hit what we go up to 605 in the warm up room, and it, I felt okay, but it wasn't great. And uh, come out and just crush 655. So that's that was my opener. So I opened five pounds over what I ended with at the last meet. Oh, so nice. that, that was probably the big one is just everybody coming up to me. Sure, you got this, bro? We can change your opener. I'm like, no, no, I got this. And uh, the judging was strict uh, that day, but, I mean, it was strict but fair. So, And that's what I told people. I was like, I don't care. I came in here to do something, and I'm going to do it. And if I get red-lighted on 655, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to go 7 next. You know, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I'm not here. Wow. You know, I'm, that's like I'm going out like – Chuck Vogelpool did, you know, fuck, I bombed that. Okay, go up 100 pounds. <laughs> I was like, that's that's why I'm here, right. you know, and it's like if I, if, if it doesn't, if the judges don't see it that way, that's fine. It, literally, I'm not there anymore to prove anything to anybody else. I had goals in my head, and I was going to do them. So, All right, Phil, let me, let me dig a little deeper here. What was it that you knew that everybody else didn't seem to know? Like, why were you high? Was it purposeful? What, what why were you confident when... What did you know that they didn't? I'm just so tight that it, it literally takes that much weight to kind of get me down there. Okay. Um, into the right position. Mm -hmm. And then I also know the minute I step on the platform, I purposely don't get myself jacked up in the warm-up room. 
it's like okay and and right now i mean i'm to the point again where like 605 is a routine weight um i can hit it no spotter anytime i want go in the gym by myself so okay. mm-hmm. i kind of knew that ah, that's okay who cares that was an inch high i'll just sink this thing so yeah. and and i also know i only have so many squats where i go low like that without my hip hurting so it's like okay i can squat this thing a couple inches high when i step on the platform i'm gonna bury it <laughs> okay yeah so that type of thing so what is it that sets you off on the platform do you think you know you hear people talk about meat magic and that sort of thing <sighs> but how i don't do you... know for me i mean i step up there and it's just go time it's like you know i played a little football when i was when i was younger and it's the minute you step on the field you know okay it's it's go time and i literally just don't don't see anything don't hear anything it, it's it's time to work <laughs> yeah. if that makes sense it's just like okay this is what all this this is what the last four months was for this is none of those reps mattered. It, that was all for this so yeah um and it's not really i'm not i don't get scared it, it's i'm excited to see what i can do you know? right yeah so arnold used uh, to it, speak about that like that concentration that weightlifters they they can just sort of call up like a bomb yeah. could be going off around you and no, it's just you in this bar, yeah. you know, kind of thing. And that's it. And the only thing that I can hear, like there was, I don't, I don't know how many people, but there was a big crowd of people there. And the only thing that I can hear now is my wife and my son and my daughter. Uh, but that's just because I'm so used to their voices because they all hear them in the gym too. So, I mean, it, I can't tune them out and it's just, I, I hear them screaming and, uh, okay, it's, it's time to go. I mean, I forget what songs are playing and everything. So <laughs> I don't see anybody like some people get really nervous in meets. I don't, you know, it's not a nervousness. I'm not like scared to fail. I've failed before. What's, what's the worst thing that happen? Yeah. Worst thing that happens, I get red lights, you know, whatever. It's no big deal. Right. Um, yeah. You can't be paralyzed by that fear. No, or... I mean, it's just an excitement and I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. You know? So I imagine that comes with experience, like a noob. I, if someone's thinking, Oh, these guys are always encouraging me to put my name on the line and, get a deadline, you know, train toward a meet and actually put myself out there in the ring, so to speak. Yeah. I don't think they, like, if they can do that from the beginning, that would be amazing to me. I think mm-hmm. a lot of what you, you can do that, just be positive and be like, just apply all of your energy in a, an aggressive way instead of a nervous way because yeah. you've just done it a million times. Yeah, yeah, and at that, that point, it's like, I know, I've, uh, I know how to do this. I've done it before. Now just do it. You know, just do it right. That's all you got to do. That's what all these practice reps are for. And I have lifters that are that are still at that point where they're in their head and things like that. And they're, they're they get about ninety percent in a meet. Um, and then that leads us to you know other things. Two other things that stuck out in my head at this last meet was uh, um, one of my lifters, Becky. She's just a game day player. She drives me crazy because we'll be. Three weeks out from the meet, and I'm like, okay, okay, Becky, we need to squat 335. And she just makes it look hard, just just horribly hard. And then, okay, we're a week out, and I'm talking about somebody we're planning on squatting 435, and she's making 335 look hard. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. And then we're one week out, it's like, okay, we need to hit 385. And she hits it, you know, but it's like, oh. And then come on the platform, she crushes it. Just, you know, you get her on the platform, and... Uh, it's just it's just a different a different day and a different person. She just kills it, and we go four oh seven and kills that. You know? Wow. So, uh, and that's the some of that I don't think is trainable. You know, even over time, it's just some people have that. Uh, I think people get better at competing because they just get less nervous. But some people are just gamers. You know, I mean, they just step up. Okay, it's game time. Let's go, and they get that extra ten percent. So that stuck out in my head, and she drives me crazy for that, and I tell her she does all the time. Um, but Because uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me as a coach because I have percentages. We need to hit this in the gym. But now for her, I know, okay, we need to squat 435. Well, we need to hit like 350 in the gym because she's good for 85 <laughs> pounds more oh, right. know, on the platform. But uh, Well, that's, that's coaching, right? Like if you stuck yeah. to some template, you would think, well, she's, she's good for – 385 <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and that's her opener you know? right right so uh yeah and it's just and she has this uncanny ability at this point now because she's been with me and she's like i just trust the process i know you're not gonna have me do anything stupid so it'll work i know i'll go in there and squat 400 
you know, and it's like, okay, well, fuck, I hope you do, because I'm not sure you're going to. Right, because you're outside of my, yeah, wheelhouse with this one. You're outside of my comfort zone, because you should be hitting this. You know, um, we have uh, had people on before talking about differences just genetically in neurotransmitters and how some people, they like to perform under pressure. Without the pressure, they, they really can't turn on. Yeah. You know, maybe it's something like that. I don't and know. And it might be. I mean, other than that, I was just, our ladies always impress us. Like, almost all of them went over 300 pounds in something. Um, and we had seven ladies out there. Strong. So we yeah. just have, yeah, we had, you know, Gina passed 300 for the first time on the platform, at least. Um, she squatted over 300, pulled over 300. Um, Kaylee came out in her first meet and hit, like, 360 squat and 365 deadlift. Oof. Um, yeah, and it's just uh, big, just crazy. The other one that stuck out in my head is Big Brian. He's the strongest person that nobody knows about. Um, oh, hmm. he came out and just obliterated nine hundred four in sleeves. Oh my god! He just, he just sat down and he comes out and he's laughing and just talking to people. You know, he wasn't. He doesn't get stoked up. Doesn't get excited. Doesn't yell and scream. I put up the video of him. He's like talking to JP, smiling, laughing, blah, 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 as the bar's ready for him. Like they're waiting for him to lift, and he's laughing and joking around, and then he just dips his head into the bar and slowly sits down and just rockets out of the hole. I mean, just crushes 904. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole place just went nuts. Um, hey, Phil, then, is, but, is yeah. this the guy that you said he's just kind of like his shoes are untied? He doesn't think about yeah, it, doesn't yeah, care. <laughs> we got him in real shoes now. That's good. Um, and uh and a belt i mean he's good for he's good for 930 you know at least in, in sleeves just raw uh, ability right just ability yeah and then i think opened his bench at 500 and that was a bad day for him i mean he got that but uh his back was cramping up mm. so it didn't go any higher than that mm -hmm. and then barely missed 904 on deadlift without a belt so hit like 850 my so I mean, just, now how how big he's was, he's big right he's a large he's mammal big. he's like I don't know he's six three I think he weighed in at three ninety six mm. so he's got thirty seven inch thighs oh that's it, I think. my god, <laughs> my god. <laughs> yeah just just huge but right. nicest guy in the world and just calm and doesn't get worked out okay I guess I'll give it a shot you know right <laughs> and we're all just shaking our head like holy crap. Yeah, but, like what would this guy do if you could really turn him on, light him up? Like, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't work for him, but it, it would yeah, make I you think know, that if you man, could. You think you could. Yeah. That, holy moly. Yeah, I don't yeah. know, man. It's going to be – It's he's a, he's a fun to work with, and it's going to be amazing to see what he can pull off in time because this is really only – I think his first meet was a year ago last weekend. Oh, my so God. Yeah. this is the third meet in a year and crushes 904 in sleeves. So – it's gonna if we can keep him healthy, which uh, I think we can. You know, it's just yeah, yeah, not stupid training, mm -hmm. and uh, but yeah, that that was pretty amazing. But those are probably the things that stuck out in my head the most. I mean, and as usual, just the camaraderie and stuff of the meets is always good. Right? How how big was it? Like how many total competitors and that kind of thing? It was two days. There was four flights of men, so sixty five guys, um, and day two there was forty five women. So. Or 47. And are they like from that. all over the country or more regional or? Uh, I'd say most of them were in, right in our area, but uh -huh. there were people all over the country too. So, Right. No. Cool. Um, your personal focus uh, over the last couple of years to me has really – you've talked about the squat as much as you've talked about your deadlift and whatnot. Are you – is the bench press a throwaway movement now for you because – you know it has been i like literally haven't trained it um i think so i did record breakers in november and i think i benched a total of four times coming up to this meet um just because my shoulder and i figured out you know it just hurts and if i i tried training it for record breakers and i just hurt more and then i couldn't bench so and the weights actually went down so uh i what was it three weeks out i just made sure i put 315 on the bar hit it for a triple made sure i could still do that i was like okay i'm good to go <laughs> right okay yeah so and then i just go in call it day to day that to this weekend it wasn't uh my shoulder was hurting so i hit i'd made small jumps i went uh 315 then 335 then 350 i think it was 
But uh, my, like I said, my shoulder was not feeling right. Like it was at Record Breakers, I went 315, 360, 405. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So it was feeling great that day. Um, right. And that's literally, I just call it on the day as far as my shoulder's feeling. That said, I mean, one of the things I'm going to start concentrating on now is uh, I'm going to try and figure that out. Basically, I need to get back up in the fours, and I'm going to try and figure out a way that I can train my bench again. What I figure is even if I'm benching super lightweight, I give him 135 and getting reps in. That's better than not. <laughs> you know? Yeah, than not at all. Exponential. That's 135 pounds more than nothing. So right. it has to. It has right. to be better. You know, it, I got to figure out a way to train that doesn't put me in pain. That's not damaging, work. right? Yeah, because yeah. basically what was happening is I was training at some, and I was training at not heavy, 70 percent, but that was enough that I'd go and try and bench, and it hurt. It just hurt, so I couldn't move load. To me, that sounds like oh. the rehab. I mean, what do you do in physical therapy? It's not – there's no real intensity or effort involved. It's just you yeah. go through the motions, and it's amazing how doing something is so much better than doing nothing at all. Yes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So basically, I'm going to start a program on, on Monday where – and I'm going to start at 135 and just get a bunch of reps in and try and slowly build up uh, – Tissues and muscle mass there. The amazing thing is I'm just amazed that I can still walk in and do 315 any day I want without training my bench. But, I mean, like one of my guys said, well, yeah, if you've benched 450 in your lifetime, it's probably pretty easy to bench 315 later on down the road. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so I'm just hanging on to stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, deadlift has been on the back seat. I, didn't, I, I haven't been training it near as much. Uh, like, basically, I squat first, and then I do my pulls after, and it's minimal. Mm -hmm. But that's because I wanted to, for the first time in my life, squat feels good. The first time in like 10 years. So because I of the hardware? That up. Is it because? Yeah, because yeah. of the because of the hip replacement. It just, yeah. it hurt before. So, you know, and I've pulled big. I've never squatted big. And it's just something I wanted to do. So yep. um, now, now that, you know, I squatted 696 and I pulled 705. So, uh now I'll start concentrating on both of them a little more and try and push my deadlift. I'd like to get the deadlift back up in the 750 plus range. So, but now now that my squat's respectable, you know, because right. before I mean there was a time where it was like, okay, here comes Philly's pulling 780 and he squatted five. You know? No, I remember so, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that was all just due to hip issues. So, yep. Uh, now they're kind of on the same page. So, uh, what about? And we've talked about the generalities of this before, but specifically about this meet, did you see people making any typical mistakes, Not, either your people or other people, you, you know, things that might might have stood out? Was everybody pretty much on point or? No, nah, there's your usual mistakes like waiting for rack commands and things like that. That's always something. And that's usually the bench is the one that people do that on the most because they get excited and just go for the rack. Um Warming up way too early and getting like getting ready way too early. So timing for a meet is a, another big one. Um, people go back there and they start getting they're ready by halfway through the flight before them. And it's like, you got a long time to wait, brother. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. You need to pace yourself. And, you know, basically I'm always looking to, we take, I take my last warm up right before we're called out there. And because, but I also know like in, I was in the last flight and I was the second to last lifter. So we get called out. Now I got 13 lifters to wait. So I'm up there for anywhere from 13 to 20 minutes. Yep. So I need to time that warm up to where I'm going. I'm taking it right before we get called out. And uh, so then that just comes in time, you know, but you see people and just massively extensive warm ups, like getting a workout in the warm up room. It's funny, so. Phil. <laughs> you know, you see the same thing a lot of times backstage in bodybuilding competitions. People will warm up and try to get a pump, and then by the time they go out on stage, they're strung out or kind of cold. They they they're mistiming it. They're doing it too far in advance, you know, and they don't walk out looking their best. Right? It, yeah. Instead of performing their best, it's more like, you know, just do you have a a pump, bro? You know, kind of yeah. thing. But yeah, it's very similar in that because you're eager. You're you know you're yeah. kind of nervous. Yeah. You're eager and you want to. You expend some of that energy and you want to be ready you know you yeah. want to be prepared um what about the beginners though like you can do that not just mentally more confident maybe but physically you could probably get away with that you know what i mean like doing your warm-up almost right before you head out yeah could a beginner do that or do they need a little more time than you 
No, I don't think they do. I think the big. I think it's just their nerves that mess with them. I think a lot of people need to throttle it back and realize this isn't a training session. You're just getting warm. You know, yeah. In a training session, sure, you're going to do lots of reps. You're looking to get stronger or build muscle mass. Today, you're literally just looking to get warm enough to express your strength. That's it. And that's all you need to worry about. Right. You know, I'm not back there hitting sets of 10 and stuff. I'm back there hitting singles and, and uh, you know, I'm going there and sitting in the hole, getting my hips loosened up, things like that. You're just, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm trying to, if I don't break a sweat, I'm happy. You know? Right. Specificity, <laughs> I'm right? I'm just getting warm. Yeah. You know, I'm getting warm to go out there and then come deadlift, you know, it's last thing of the day. If I'm not warm now, I'm not getting there, you know, so I'll literally go in and pull. I think, what did I do? I did 405, 495, 585, done, ready to go. You know? Yeah, okay. Three or, three or four total reps, and it was like, anything after that, I'm just wearing myself out because it's been a long day already. So, yeah. Okay. Any trends that you saw with this meet? Um, you oh, know, just, I mean, whether it's the, more women, the equipment, oh, you know, tons, anything, tons. any trends at all. Tons. I mean, the tons of women. It's amazing they get their own day now. Like me and uh, – a couple other lifters that have been doing it as long or longer than me were talking about that, and we were like, "You, we can remember when you would go to a meet and be amazed there was one woman. You know, you were amazed. Oh, wow, there's a girl lifting. Yeah, you know? yeah. And now there's a day. You know, that's a huge difference, and that's only been in the last ten years. That is giant. I mean, mm-hmm. women have have come onto the scene hugely, and it's amazing. So, and I also think they've brought up the uh, made the sport more popular. In general, and that was also true. What this past weekend, then more lots, yeah. lots of ladies. Yeah, they, they had a full day yeah. for themselves. Right. So they had three full fights of nothing but women. So which was amazing, and they are getting unworldly strong. I what mean, are they? If I can ask, because I honestly don't know. What are do they do anything differently with equipment, with warm ups, anything different that you've seen the way the women go about it? Hmm. Or is it just to say pretty much the same? No, the only thing different I see about it is women like cheer each other on even more than men. They're like, "Woo, come on!" You know, they yeah. are like on each other, which is awesome. They're very supportive of each other. Um, but uh, no, I mean, in the warm ups and things like that, no. I mean, I don't think there's anything different. Yeah. But uh, there's a lot more wardrobe changes than men. <laughs> so, oh, I've, I've seen women that like they have a different singlet for each event. So here's my squat singlet. Okay, time to change. Here's my bench singlet. Oh, huh. like, looking good, <laughs> but uh, and then we're all sweaty and got chalk all over us. And yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I wonder if maybe there's a maturity issue. You know how they often say women are more mature on average than men in their behaviors. Yeah. And I even heard that might be one theory behind why women live longer than men. You know, they huh. they kind of take care of themselves. And I like what you said about how they encourage each other because ultimately gravity is the enemy, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. each other. You're, it's, yeah. you're the opponents of gravity, you know. I they're, still want to yeah, make a T-shirt. They're very much more supportive of each other than the guys are, and that's not saying the guy. It's a very supportive sport in general, but they are like way outwardly supportive. So it's pretty yeah. amazing. Um, other than that, just raw lifting. It's it's here and it's not going anywhere, and it's back and it's the king of things. Um, what a turnaround since you been, began. Oh yeah, you know, huge. Yeah, and again, I used to be the raw lifter. Like we'd go to a meet, and I was the raw dude. You know, yeah. Everybody else was an equipment. Almost like, yeah, the quirky dude who's insistent yeah. on doing it this way. Yeah. Yeah. I was the old, so look at this guy. He's doing vintage squats. Yeah. Yeah. Know? Right. Yeah. And uh, now I think there was one, I think there was one person that was in equipment. So out of two or 125 lifters or whatever it was. So. And that wasn't the, that wasn't a rule of the meat then? Uh, it, like it wasn't a raw meat then? Or? No. You could dinner, single ply, multiply, or raw. Gotcha. So, yeah, so and there's just not as many people in the equipped no. Um, no, categories. I mean, there's not near as many people doing it anymore. So Wow. Well, we've had discussions about equipment and that stuff, that sort of thing before. It, I've never actually lifted in any, in a, you know, a suit or anything like that. But I always kind of got the vibe that it was, it was just so different. You know, that it's more about like almost like driving a car. Like you have to drive. Like when you bench press, you got to hit a certain groove. When you squat, you've almost got to fall back into this suit. Like, it just seems like different. Oh, yeah. M- neuromuscularly, different just different g- game, yeah. you know. But. See, and I wear briefs in a lot of my squat training um, just for hip support. But uh, And then I'll take those off two or three weeks out. But those aren't near as supportive as a – I mean, they're like really tight underwear. 
You know? Right. Yes. But, uh, comparatively, I can still like squat down without any weight. Right. So the skill but, is the uh, same. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, right. but no, I mean, those are the big things. I mean, it's just, it's neat. It's seeing the sport is booming more than I have ever seen it. Um, I wasn't around in like the early eighties and things like that sure, doing it sure. when it was, but, uh, compared to what I've seen, it's just, it's giant. So one last thing. What about the after meet? Um, physical, you know, were you beat up? Uh, what's the oh, so- just social, tired. everything? Like, what do you guys do? Do you just all go home for a week? Or? We went, no, I mean, well, so basically we had to, my day got done. We all went out and ate. Yep. I was just tired. And, uh, and then I had to wake up and coach seven ladies the next day. Oh Lord. So, uh, basically I just went and got ready for that. But, um, and then afterwards, like this week, it's, it's been move around week for everybody. It's like, just go in the gym and have fun. Do whatever you want. You know, don't squat, bench, or deadlift. You know, do anything besides that. So, and for me, it's literally, I haven't been doing anything. You know, I'm not muscularly sore after a meet. Uh, I'm joint sore. Yeah. So just from moving, you know, 700 pounds and 705 pounds, it's just, just achy. I would know. think if you peaked right, that's how it should be, really. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you're not doing 10 sets of five in the warm-up yeah. room, you know. Yeah, you're doing nine reps. <laughs> right. Really. Very heavy, heavy but right. Yeah. So, the volume is uh, yeah, so I'm, low. Yeah, I'm not muscularly sore at all. I'm just like drained. You know, you're you're really tired. Like and nervous system. It. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh Yeah, because you couldn't have burned that much fuel either with that no. you know, low volume. It's just nervous system fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm down what I weigh in at. I had to cut for the first time in my life to make two seventy five. Um oh. so I weighed in like a pound light. And then was back up to my regular weight the next day at 283. And I'm, I went to, so immediately after the meet, okay, I'm done cramming my face and I've just ate normal this week and I'm at 270 now. So I'm 13 pounds light after a week and it's just bloat and poop. Oh, right. Oh, right. But, uh, what you guys do to your, your body weights, just, I, I can't think of any sport that, you know, it, that compares with like at least the big guys in powerlifting, you know, yeah. the, Oh, I'm going to cut 28 pounds. I got to get down under <laughs> like, wait in a couple of days. What, what, you know, like yeah, the good thing for me, it was an easy cut. Basically I just didn't eat much the day before and I only drank 40 ounces of water, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I made it pretty easy. Uh, I just watched my eating and hydration for a couple of days. And so I didn't have to sweat or anything like that to make it right. But, uh, a lot of people do. But yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I was 283 coming the next day, and uh, and that's where I had been walking around weeks prior. It was about two in between 280, 285, yeah. and you know, just cramming my face with whatever I could, so chips and oh, you know, right. I, every time I left to go to the gym, I'd grab snacks. I'll and never forget, all. right? Your wife coming out with the trays of like the cookie brownie yeah. hybrid things <laughs> they're like they're yeah. both and i'm like damn like these guys are going to gain weight <laughs> yeah so it's just it's good to get back to just you know, this week it's just been back to eating meats and veg and eggs and things like that and i'll do that my plan is to stick with that through all summer so i'll stay lighter just more comfortable summer. eating yeah uh, yeah and i'm how well, i can tell people i'm older now i i want to i want to live past 45 i can't eat like that year round no agreed I'm not doing it anymore so I'll, I'll take stints for, you know, 12 weeks. Let's eat like crazy. And then, okay, back to normal. So Right, yeah. But, no, good stuff. I, yeah, I just thought people might be interested since you just did that. And you did break some new ground in the squat and that sort of thing. And, and I do like the idea. It kind of feeds off of Grant's email about your hip, you know, that maybe this is a, a motivator for you. Like this is a new yeah. direction where every time you up the numbers – at least as far as we know, you're the highest one doing that. Like you're, yeah. or at least very near the top of someone breaking yeah. ground with this. And let's face it, hip replacements are so common now, yeah. uh, and even knees that you're going to see more of that. You know, so it's just for sure. It's not a it's not a sentence to just not be active for the right. rest of your life. Right. You know, I don't run anymore and things like that. I I listen to my doctor as far as that. I don't do, I don't do jumping. I don't do right. you know. Because he just said, "Don't do that." He well, thank God me, your sport doesn't call for it. Yeah, and he exactly. And he literally told me the only time you should do that is if you're on a building on fire. So it's like, okay, he's pretty serious <laughs> about this. So <laughs> I, I'll listen to him. Right. So he's that serious about it. But because uh, I want it to last, as, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I want this hip to last as long as it can. 
because I know I'll be getting another one. And and I want to put that off as long as I can, but it's not going to stop me from doing something I enjoy passionately. Right. So. <clears throat> All right. Good stuff. Well, there you have it, everybody. A little bit of meat talk. We haven't done that in a while. It's, it's fun to do that. And, I mean, we need to cash in on the way that Phil does compete. Like you said, it sort of defined you. Some people just like to train. Some people, it's just in your in their makeup. They they have to go wade into battle a little bit yeah, here and there. It's, you know. it's, yeah, it's fun. So. All right. Uh, well, until next week, everyone. Yep, have a good one. Thanks, guys. Hey, it's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here, and wanted to just talk a little bit about my top three to five things that I've learned from my travel log so far this year in 2018 from going to different conferences, and as this is being recorded, we're actually driving back from the Fitness Summit, Kansas City, which was very fun, had an amazing time there, got to present once again for the I think it was my sixth time presenting there, something like that. So I was talking about the effect of carbohydrates and exercise, looking at a model for them based on eustress versus distress. Um, so that was a lot of fun. So on my little list I've got here, on number one, I was able to spend uh, two weeks down in Costa Rica uh, a couple months ago. Uh, at my friend Dr. Ben House at his retreat center down there, Flow. If you just look up, you can find him at Functional Medicine or Functional Med Costa Rica. Type that into the old Googles, it'll show up. And the biggest thing that struck me was for being down there for two weeks, uh, if you've ever been to that part of the world or Costa Rica, it gets daylight very early. Like the Monkeys wake you up around 5.30ish or so, and it is full daylight by 6 a.m. And then in the evening, it gets dark very soon. And the other interesting part is they don't have as much ambient light around. So the place that he has, which is very awesome, is literally in the middle of the jungle, out in uh, near Uvita, Costa Rica. And the thing that was really impactful to me, other than the general environment, which I'll get to in a bit, was that I I felt like I didn't sleep super well the whole time I was there. But yet, if I look at how I felt, I felt pretty good most of the time. I actually consumed uh, less caffeine overall, with the exception of uh, a few days here and there where I had some deadlines. I was working on a position stand while I was down there. And I got up pretty early because of the, the light and some of the howler monkeys losing their minds in the mornings, too. So the temperature was quite warmer than what I was used to. Uh, we did have air conditioning in some of the units, which helped quite a bit. Um, but I felt like my sleep wasn't super great, but during the day, I felt great. Uh, which kind of makes me wonder a little bit. I started doing some more research on uh, sleep efficiency. and takeaway with that is if you hit 100% sleep efficiency, meaning the second your head hits the pillow, you are out and you wake up and spring out of bed in the morning, that would be as close as you can get to of 100% sleep efficiency. And the only time you really see that is when you are sleep deprived. I'm sure this has happened to everyone. So you go out, don't get a lot of sleep for a few days, and you go lay down at night and boom, you're like fast asleep. Your so sleep efficiency is very high, but that actually means you have a pretty big sleep debt that you're trying to repay. So in my case, again, I'll get into maybe a better way of tracking sleep. Uh, sleep efficiency, according to the Fitbit watch, which is actually a Garmin that I have, uh, looks at just movement during the night, which uh, can be a good proxy for sleep for the most part from what we have. And it wasn't the greatest, but I felt good. So I think years past, I've been trying to hit a very high sleep efficiency score, and that's probably not useful. Again, talking to my friend Dan Party, probably one somewhere around 85-ish percent, maybe low 90% sleep efficiency. If it starts getting way worse than that, you're spending a whole bunch of time laying in bed, not sleeping, which is not useful. It should take you a few minutes to fall asleep at night, and that's actually a good marker. So what I did when we got back 
is I ended up buying a little alarm clock that's got a bright light on it. So in the morning, the light will start getting brighter and brighter and brighter to try to simulate the sun. Since we have all these dark shades to make it dark at night, we live in Minnesota, so we get much more extremes from darkness and light depending on the season. So I just got that before I left, so I'll let you know how that goes overall, but the few nights that I used it, it did seem to help. Um, related to that too, I probably mentioned this before, getting more daylight exposure first thing in the morning, no sunglasses, no windows, is super helpful to reset your circadian rhythm, and the photons come into the back of the eye, and they help uh, anchor your circadian rhythm, which is super helpful. Again, I originally got that from my buddy Dan Party. Find him at Human OS. So that was super interesting, and also related to the environment down there, uh, being away from kind of the normal stimulus. We had a chef who was awesome, Jed, who cooked for us the whole time. We had learning in the morning. We'd get up, we'd go down and do like a Zen style meditation, which was great after a little hike, and hang out next to the waterfall and do that many times great breakfast, go do some learning. Uh, I was there teaching, helping the second week, and usually some type of activity in the afternoon, or we would go lift at the gym, and then just kind of hang out and socialize at night. And I also realized that being <coughs> at a different environment allowed me to do those things with less of the cues that you would have at home. So I think if you're looking to make a massive change in lifestyle and maybe habits per se, dropping someone into a completely new environment is going to be a great way to get a lot of awareness and to get some practice and some easier reps doing that. Number two uh, down there was uh, Dr. Brian Walsh, who I've interacted with a lot over the years, but I finally got to meet him in person, which was very awesome. Great guy, um, just really good information. And I think the biggest thing that I took away from him, uh, a little bit on blood glucose, I need to go back and review to see if what I think I know is right. I think it's probably wrong. I'll probably have more on that once I figure out what's going on. He's got a great course on that. And he also presented some very good information on detox diets. And I will be the first to admit, whenever I hear the word a detox diet, I almost want to put my head through a wall. All the stuff that I normally see just seems like a horrible idea. No one would tell me what toxin they're detoxing, and the stuff they did just seems really insane. There was no research based on it. And uh, Dr. Bryan's program that he has on it was actually the direct opposite of that. Uh, he had really good data showing that, for the most part, most people are probably toxic to some degree. Again, that doesn't mean everyone needs to be super worried about it. But when you're going on, uh, let's say, a, a diet or fat loss or cutting phase, you are causing some of these toxins to be released. Right? So a lot of them are stored in the fat cells and the fat tissue. And as you know from listening to the show, when you are reducing calories and other things increase in exercise, you're in a caloric deficit, you're starting to use more fat as a fuel. So you're breaking down more of the fat and you're increasing potentially your load of toxins into the body. So he's got a great program on that that shows you what particular foods can help with that at particular times. Um, I haven't done it yet, but it's on my list just to test it out. Again, he had some great data showing uh, what other particular toxins that there may be involved. And the program we put together was pretty good. It was something I think most people can do. And he goes into the different phases of detoxification and what is going to be beneficial uh, at each time. So that was probably the best program I've seen on that. And I just really enjoyed hanging out with him, <coughs> talking with him, and picking his brain. So... I don't make any money if you pick that up or not, but uh, so far, that's the best one I've seen. It actually changed my mind on a lot of the detox type stuff. Number three is a very cool interaction that I had at Paleo FX in Austin, Texas recently. So we were down there. I was presenting on some 
effectiveness of dietary protein and on a panel as the panel I was on was fitness for everyone and on the panel was a Paul check which was super interesting and Paul is definitely Paul so that was uh, interesting chatting with him uh, buddy Dr. Andy Gelpin who's awesome he's got some great stuff <clears throat> Daryl Edwards who actually picked me up at one point during the panel discussion so that was a little bit freaky as he's spinning me around and didn't crash set me back down so nothing bad happened with that I only from from was on there also and Eva T so great panel good discussion um, but a useful thing while I was at paleo effects is got to talk to my buddy Hapri who is one of the key people at the aura ring which is O U R A and I followed it for quite a while. I've had them send me all the white papers and all the studies that they've done on it. And it, you've probably seen it. It's a tracker that you can wear, but it's a ring. And what I like about that is it's geared a little bit more towards recovery, not so much use during exercise per se, although you can. And the sleep tracking on it is really good. Um, I used to have, I know, Dr. Lonnie had also the Zio device where you would put this thing around your head, you would look at EEG, so your brain waves and accelerometer or movement. But unfortunately, they went under. A device that they made was, was very good, but you had to wear this, this sexy headband at night, or at least my wife told me it was sexy. It probably wasn't. She's sitting here smiling in the car at me. Um, the ring is nice, much less intrusive and it's very accurate it'll do a heart rate variability which you know i'm a big fan of although i'm not a big fan of most of the hrv devices on the market there are some that are good but most of them i don't trust all that much at least the consumer ones and the nice part about the ring is it'll look at hrv it'll look at heart rate and the reason they went with the ring is because of the physiologic position that it's at they'll sample the waveform right from the pressure going through the vessel uh, 250 times a second so I can get very accurate data and as I mentioned heart rate HRV temperature uh, they can tell you respirations so your breathing rate because that's going to be coupled to pulse uh, pressure some fancy math you can pull that out and it was great talking to him uh, the new rings just started uh, being shipped, so I was able to get one of the very first ones, which is very awesome to test out for myself. App's really good, it's very useful, and what I also liked about it is not only is it accurate, it's easy to use, and as I mentioned, the sleep tracking on it, if you're looking at sleep metrics for recovery, as far as I can tell, it's probably the best one out there right now. Uh, I haven't looked at everything on the market, but I haven't seen anything else that comes close to it in terms of accuracy. I do have a study that is published on the sleep tracking itself, and it showed that it was very good. Uh, literally just the other day, they had a study published in the journal Sleep, looking at the heart rate variability portion also. Uh, that was shown to be quite accurate too. So, if you're looking for something that's kind of a non-invasive tracker, check out the Aura Ring, O-U-R-A, and if you want to use the code Dr. Mike, D-R-M-I-K-E, we'll save you 50 bucks. Uh, I do make a couple bucks off of that, but really not all that much. So, of all the HRV devices out there, I've only really liked the Ithlete device, which is an app and a heart rate strap. And this is the, probably the second device that I really like and personally use myself. Number four, as I wrap up my little segment here, uh, interesting things that I've learned at conferences and seminars so far this year, traveling around. I guess I put this into the area that the thing is you probably don't think about all that much. But if you're a strength coach, if you're a presenter, if you're a fitness professional, um, how you interact with other people makes a big difference. You can get into things like eye contact, body position, and that's been more interesting for me to observe, both in myself uh, and other people. So it's a little bit out there, but as I've done some more uh, eye work, 
which can be done via also some body work or self-massage, like the RPR system, and then also through functional neurology. My HRV, heart rate variability, has gone up, which has been better, and I don't get nearly as burnt out having interactions with other people. In the past, I've got notes, I've been at paleo effects probably five or six times now, and this is the best my heart rate variability has ever been <coughs> at the end, and I was probably busier this time than any other time. So when I was down there, I, I did a talk, as I mentioned, one on protein, I did the panel, uh, did some hands-on work on guys like Andy Gelpin, uh, one of the members of the Houston Texans, uh, Ben Pakulski, very huge, super nice bodybuilder. So very busy, but I think by working on my aerobic base and my ability to do better interactions with people was less stressful to me <coughs> and then made recovery easier after that. One other thing I would throw in there, although my voice is a little bit not the greatest right now, is I did some voice work with a professional from the Mayo. I don't think she works with clients all that much outside of the Mayo, but if you need her information, uh, drop me an email. I'll definitely get it to you. She did a great job. Thanks, Diana. And doing some basic vocal drills so that my voice is not completely gone at the end of two days or three days, in the case of paleo effects, talking for almost the entire day. So that was... I remember the thing that I had talked to her, and she said, well, how's your voice after two or three days of presenting? I said, oh, well, it's just crap. I sometimes lose my voice, or it's so bad I can't even really have a conversation for <clears throat> two or three days after. And she mentioned something to me and said, well, that's not normal. You know, that's you shouldn't have that happen. You're probably overusing your vocal cords and just how you're producing your voice. That was the first time I just thought, oh, so maybe I can do something about this and not just assume that it's normal. So, last thing there, uh, interactions, what do you do with fitness, I think, before you're put in a more stressful or busy time and things you probably don't think about, such as uh, vocal training. So she gave me some cool drills to use that were pretty simple and have helped me immensely. So... There you go. Those are my top four things from this past year of traveling around and different conferences. Thanks. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each Hall of Iron are actually based on our own recommendations protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, 
please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.